So good morning, everyone. I think people are going to continue to file in, and so happy Friday. I have no interesting meteorological event to talk about today other than it's winter and we have no snow, and I think that's very sad. So uh, for Grand Rounds today, I think we are very honored to have Dr. Howard Bailey presenting Grand Rounds today, and his title for Grand Rounds is Cancer Prevention, Agent Development Waiting for Godot. So I would say that you know, Dr. Bailey uh, is uh, someone who has really a very prestigious leadership position here at our institution, and I'm very thankful that he is taking time out of his world to talk to us. And you might not, you might not know what his position is, but he, he is the director for the UW Carbone Cancer Center, and he is also the associate dean for oncology at the UW School of Medicine and Public Health. And as all of you know, our Paul Carbone Cancer Center uh, is nationally renowned. So a little bit about the history of Dr. Bailey. He uh, did his medical degree at University of North Dakota School of Medicine. He followed that with his internship and residency at Southwest Michigan Area Health Education Center in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and then started his career at University of Wisconsin, where he has stayed ever since. He did his oncology medicine fellowship here, and that was followed by a research fellowship in the Physician Scientist Research Program, which was within the Paul Carbone Cancer Center at that time. I always like to talk a little bit about people's uh, awards and interesting things, and I think you know, Dr. Bailey is an example of someone who is a very prestigious researcher. He is a, a well-known clinician, and mo his most recent award was actually the UW Health Experience Physician Champion Award in 2016, and that's a, an award, as many of you know, that's given by our patients uh, to uh, providers uh, because of the great care that they give our patients. And I think that's a great tribute to someone uh, who lives most of his uh, really world in the research area. When I asked Dr. Bailey what he was most proud of, uh, he said that um, he's most proud that he came from North Dakota and, and, and he is here uh, practicing medicine. And his quote is, I'm from North Dakota and I'm glad to be here. So, that being said, uh, we are very thankful to have you here and really interested to hear your talk so hard. Please come up. And then we'll do questions after. Thank you very much. Um, I am glad to be here. So, um, you know, they uh, advised me that they wanted kind of a catchy title. Uh, I have to give credit to uh, Dr. Ruth Reagan, who very politely taught me how to pronounce Godot, because I had different ways of pronouncing it, given my cultural Neanderthalism. So, um, so um, the, the, the concept being that am I, are we waiting for something absurd that isn't going to happen? Um, again, I have to admit a certain cultural ignorance. Uh, I haven't read it haven't seen it, but I've always known the term, so I had to kind of double check to make sure I remembered the term correctly, but that is kind of the message that I'm trying to convey, and I hope it isn't waiting for a good o when it comes to chemo prevention for, for cancer prevention. Um, some of you might know that there's been a fair bit in the news lately about uh, oncologists conveniently forgetting their conflict of interest when it comes to presenting their research so I thought I would go a little overboard. That and the fact that because I can be influenced by a free can of Mountain Dew, I thought I'd put a little bit more of it up here. Uh, but if you went to my conflict of interest statement, you would see nothing there because I have no um, uh, conflicts that meet the usual criteria. But you never know. Some of these things might materialize someday. But my track record would be that most of the companies I get involved with go belly up, so I'm not overly hopeful of a big payday when it comes to this. So the agenda of what we're going to speak about today really is, is listed here. And re some of the prior discussions that we've had, I've focused on kind of what is the current status of approved agents, where are we going, somewhat even made a plea that we're not using as many, uh, the, the proven and the FDA approved cancer prevention agents as much as we might. But what I wanted to do today is really just give a little bit more of a ongoing story of how we're trying to develop cancer prevention agents and some of the uh, 
dilemmas, struggles that we have with that. So that's what the main focus is going to be related to my talk today. So we've discussed this before, the history of carcinogenesis study, some of the aspects of it, and, and the bottom line being that it's a multi-year process. And this is certainly true of really any of the things that we look at in preventative health, whether it's vascular disease, uh, neurodegenerative disease, et cetera. We, the more we study it, the more we know that it tends to be a gradual process over many years, which gives us, in theory, opportunities to intervene, to change that process. So this is just a visualization of it uh, that I've showed before and data, and for the most part, whether this is viewed as breast cancer, breast carcinogenesis, or colon carcinogenesis, or what have you, is that it's a many year process. And one of the things that I'd like to really stress to the trainees is that the, the bottom line when it comes to looking at and diagnosing neoplasia, in this case, malignancy, it's this factor of invasiveness. That the difference between carcinoma in situ, which really is not a malignancy, and a malignancy is again invasion, as depicted here in the visualization. That carcinoma in situ, in many respects, is it has all the nuclear atypia, the proliferation, all the things you would expect in a malignancy, but you we're not finding invasion. And we worry that maybe we're somehow missing it, which is why we call it carcinoma in situ, wondering that maybe somewhere there's this invasion. But because this is, again, a multi-year process, again, it gives us an opportunity to intervene. So what I wanted to show was the various FDA-approved agents that have to do with limiting the incidence or limiting the development of invasive disease. And on the screen here, you see it, whether it's in breast cancer or silicoxib for FAP. But one of the things that I want you to take notice of is the actual FDA indication. I've got a couple more slides here coming up of it of why it was FDA approved. Because what you'll see is some agents that are approved literally to reduce the incidence or to prevent cancer, but many of them are to treat an underlying pre-cancer condition, or in what we'll describe a little bit more, uh, intraepithelial neoplasia, especially superficial bladder cancer here. Now clearly, or treatment of, or prevention of infections that lead to cancer, oncogenic infection here, or the story with HPV vaccines, which is obviously could be multiple talks on its own, uh, work that we've been involved in. The one point I just wanted to bring up to all of you is the recent FDA expansion of the target population for Gardasil 9 uh, from the usual 9 to 26 to now ages 27 to 45 for men and women. Again, the reason being that when we study HPV, we find that you can still get exposed to oncogenic HPV uh, at later ages. That's been an issue, especially from a nursing home standpoint, other things. So again, there is a role here related to that. And then finally, further agents, and again, if you look at the FDA indication, really more treatment of this precancer, and that we'll describe a little bit more here coming up, and a lot of topical things in skin. So this slide summarizes that, that again, a lot of the FDA approved agents are there because either they were discovered that they had preventative possibilities in our studies and therapy, and that's certainly the case with tamoxifen and raloxifene and aromatase inhibitors, which aren't FDA approved for ca breast cancer prevention, but that most of these are treatment of underlying preneoplasia. Uh, whether it's superficial bladder cancer, whether it's actinic keratosis for the skin. Um, and again, historically, we'd like to have had, again, a more of a developmental pattern with it, but our history, and I've presented some of this data in the past, was that we frequently went straight from what we thought was compelling epidemiologic data right to phase three prospective studies and to basically cut to the chase, we failed miserably and spent hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to prove that they weren't effective. So when we think of cancer prevention or chemo prevention agent development, the goal is as listed here, rather than taking this prior approach of just going straight from epidemiology to prospective studies, there should be kind of a biological basis for it. 
um, that we should then systematically follow that through the various phases of clinical trials and proving that, hopefully having lower risk that we're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to prove little, um, since that's not a good use of resources. So I'm mainly going to focus on these early phase trials today and describe a little bit how we do it. Um, but again, the goal here would be to come up with, again, safe and tolerable agents. And unlike therapy, and many of you know this with, with your practices, again, when people are taking something on a preventative measure, any degree of toxicity can be a problem. And again, it's hard to argue sometimes against that. If you're otherwise healthy and I ask you to take an agent that makes you not healthy for the day that you might get some other illness and we're trying to prevent that, that's a hard sell at times. And again, where we struggle is the issue with things like what are the pertinent biomarkers, and I'll describe a little bit more of that later. And again, other aspects of it, some that I'll get into today, some that I'm not, but just to put out there for you, are they given chronically, or can we give them more like we do in adjuvant therapy, give it for six months, and that leads to the lessened risk. And I'm not going to spend that much time on it today, but even we struggle with our later stage studies or our phase three studies, and the prime example again being what should be the endpoints of it. Um, certainly there's been a fair bit of work in colon cancer prevention with using adenomatous polyp incidence. And again, that seems reasonable, and we think there's data to support it. But on the flip side, we did all these large studies in prostate cancer prevention with prostate cancer incidence as the primary endpoint. That would make sense. But what we determined and found out is that wasn't the right endpoint. That wasn't the best endpoint in terms of globally for all of us, whether it's diabetes, whether it's heart disease. At the end of the day, obviously our goal is how do we help people live better and live longer? Um, and sometimes maybe cancer incidence alone isn't the primary aspect of that. So when we think of cancer prevention agent development, Really, the holy grail for us is can we come up with, can we have, can we determine what is a good surrogate marker? Um, again, just to describe as I've done before, in cancer therapy, which I used to do decades ago, the surrogate marker that we all accept, and there's pretty good data to support it, is that when somebody's cancer disease, whether it's a tumor, whether it's their leukemia burden, when we diminish that, we know there's an overwhelming likelihood they're going to live better and likely live longer because of it. Um, and because that's a goal that we can measure and determine relatively quickly, it's advantageous. And similar to vascular disease, we're trying to find that too. Um, in that there are accepted surrogates, whether it's your lipid level, whether it's your blood pressure. And the keys to that for us in, as we try and learn from others in cancer prevention is that measuring your blood pressure, measuring your lipid levels are non-invasive, relatively inexpensive, they are quantitative, and they are reasonably predictive. And again, so that's what we strive for, and I'll give you the over, overarching theme of my talk, we ain't got that. We're not even close to that. But we're continuing to look for those possibilities. So similar, to vascular health as an example, we're trying to come up with that accepted surrogates that we can use. So I'll describe a little bit here some of the things we're looking at. And again, I want to stress, we do not have a proven surrogate marker. Um, but we've got to start and we're trying and we're looking for the different things we can. And we think about intraepithelial neoplasia, which I'll describe here later. Tissue biomarkers, which I'll give some examples from some of our studies. And again, Towards the end, I'll describe some research we're doing to look at some of the issues with the, aid, with the biomarkers we do study, which is that there's incredible variability. Uh, there's a lot of issues. We are really at the infancy stage of this relative to uh, kind of the strengths and the, the knowledge that in vascular prevention that they've learned over the years of, of the work that they've done. So if we think with cancer Intraepithelial whether that's dysplasia, whether that's carcinoma in situ, whether that's
that's melanoma in situ, whether that's myelodysplastic syndrome, is that they frequently share, again, the phenotypic changes and even the genotypic changes. And there's a lot of work going on right now. You've heard about the cancer genome atlas. Well, people are putting together the equivalent pre-cancer genome atlas, looking at dysplasia, looking at in situ disease, and characterizing what are the genetic changes. And they do follow basically a similar pattern to invasive disease in that it's a fairly consistent thing. Intraepithelial plasia is already considered a disease or a treatment by many, whether that's polyps, whether that's actinic keratosis. And I want to give a, a credit and a shout out to Jim Stein, who many years ago taught me that one of the reasons that vascular preventative work took off and has become kind of the accepted thing is that people decided that treating lipids, treating blood pressure, those things were that, treating them even though they are, again, surrogate markers. So we have some of that in cancer, and that intraepithelial and neoplasia is treated like a disease in some situations. But the catch is there's a lot of disagreement on diagnosis. It is not quantitative, like a blood pressure reading or like a lipid level. Uh, it's slow and relatively low, slow rate of progression, in fact, the more we study intraepithelial neoplasia, whether it's in situ disease, whether it's dysplasia, the more we know across almost all tissue sites that there's a high rate of just spontaneous regression too. Whether that's uh, cervical in situ disease, cer cervical epithelium, again, there's a regression rate without doing anything. Actinic keratosis, a regression rate. The work that people have done here in our GI group Rich Hallberg, Perry Pickard from radiology has shown that, again, small polyps will regress spontaneously. So, again, when we think about what we're doing, if we use that as the endpoint, if we're getting rid of intraepithelial neoplasia, are we getting rid of the stuff that was going to remit on its own, or are we getting rid of the lesions that someday were going to go on to invasive disease? And that's some of the issues that we struggle with. And here's examples, again, of the different areas that one might look at related to intraepithelial neoplasia. And we do look at these areas, and we do studies in these areas. Uh, and all of them are, again, have their roles and are treated or feared, if you will, by us as clinicians to various degrees. We also study, again, other and look for other biomarkers, trying, again, to simplify, trying to look at other aspects of this. Again, whether it's germline mutations and risk, and I'll give some, some future directions about that later. Tissue signatures or epigenetics, and again, I'll give some examples of things that we're looking at research-wise with our both here and colleagues elsewhere. And nonspecific biomarkers, <coughs> examples being tissue proliferation, whether it's KI-67, PCNA, or cyclin B1, and again, I'll show you examples of that. And so proliferation, we want to make less proliferation. We want tissues to prolif proliferate less. Or apoptosis, where we'd like to see greater or better or more apoptosis in tissue at risk. So whether it's caspase or tunnel. And then we've done research and continue to look at very specific signal transduction biomarkers. Again, I want to stress we cannot and do not have evidence to prove that that is clearly the surrogate we should look at. I'm not going to show you the data we've done years ago with looking at polyamine biosynthesis as our biomarker. Um, but again, we're, we're studying targets, we're studying pathways that we know are valuable or important in carcinogenesis with the hope that if we perturb or inhibit that, we are indeed going to change or limit or prevent carcinogenesis. So how the National Cancer Institute has gone about this over the years is in the past, if we go back 20 years, it was a bit of a free-for-all that everyone was doing their own thing and there wasn't a whole lot of direction. So good or bad, and as we all know, when the government gets involved, that's good or bad, depending on how you look at it. And so they've got involved, and the NCI, and specifically the Division of Cancer Prevention, wanted to formalize it, wanted to centralize, wanted to pursue this goal of having a more systematic biological approach to developing cancer prevention agents. So in the early 2000s, they put out an RFA for contracts and asked groups to put together groups or consortia that they would be the only in the lead sites 
for cancer prevention agent development for the NCI. And we were fortunate to be one of the six lead consortia sites starting in 2003, and the others are listed here, that were then performing those studies. And our, our initial group was composed of these organizations and institutions um, with us leading it, and kind of leading it for those of you been involved in various clinical trials, we're like the coordinating center, whether it's an industry coordinating center or a NIH coordinating center. So we're the coordinating center of these other sites and performing the research. And this is some examples of the different clinical trials we initially did. And one of the things you probably will note is that a lot of these are more nutrient-based and I'll describe and you'll, we'll show you as we move forward how we're moving a bit away from that. But at the time, that was most of the agents available that we could look at, whether it's genistein that I'll describe later, or dienomethane, which is an indole 3 carbonyl metabolite, green tea, and I'll describe this, which is a novel rexenoid later, a selective estrogen receptor modulator, a PPAR gamma agonist, vitamin D and genistein, self-explanatory, and pomegranate, and prostate cancer. Some of the studies we've done are in the process of completing. So this went on, and these were federal contracts. In 2012, they decided that it was successful enough that they would recompete them. And uh, we were fortunate enough to be uh, successfully recompete our consortia. I'll tell kind of an interesting story. As many of you know, the, the pleasures of dealing sometimes with the, the National Institute of Health or the NCI specifically. So these were contracts, not unlike De Department of Defense contracts. We had to do things that presumably people who are making bombs for our, our government have to do when it comes to federal contracts. So needless to say, the bureaucracy was at times circuitous, but one of the aspects of it was that we had to negotiate our final contract before they would approve it. And I should put air quotes around negotiate because as you remember when I showed it to begin with, there were six consortia, and now there's five, and that's because the sixth one decided they were going to play hardball on the negotiation. And uh, what that meant was the NCI just axed them. Because uh, in their terms, negotiation meant here's what you get, accept it, and they tried to kind of negotiate a better contract, and the NCI just said, uh, we'll see you later. So um, a valuable lesson when it comes to how you define negotiation. Make sure that we share the same definition of it. So in 2012, our consortium included these sites. We had some changes. We added in some sites that have been valuable and important. And I'll show you some of the research related to that. So uh, as we've moved forward with that, and these are some of the studies that we've either finished or ongoing, and again, trying to get more into agents with targets, with known mechanisms of action whether it's, again, an EGFR receptor inhibitor, uh, erlotinib, again, here's just finishing up pomegranate, the rexenoid that I'll describe, an exemestane, an ongoing aromatase inhibitor study. I'll describe WACVAC, a vaccine study, and we'll do a little bit more about that. A combination study of metformin pioglitazone, ongoing. We are about to start a topical uh, green tea cervical prevention study. And we're still waiting to do a very novel HPV vaccine that I'll describe a little bit more later, which is L2-based rather than L1-based, and I'll describe a little bit of the rationale for that. So to give you an update on that, so that's presumably been relatively successful. So just this fall, they recompeted the consortia again. And if I was even less available than I'm normally not so available, it was because over the last few months we were writing this consortia and they gave us all of eight weeks to do it. Um, so pulling together all the institutions that I show below here and talking about studies we were going to do. So we are hopeful that we'll be refunded. I guess to admit my own potential embarrassment if we're not, it's not like we're competing against a hundred others here. I mean the odds are pretty stacked in our favor because there aren't that many consortia out there competing. So. If you don't see me around for a while, it's because I'm too embarrassed to show my face uh, because maybe we didn't get it. But So I'm going to be hopeful that we will indeed be refunded again related to this. So how it works, how it's worked in the past, how it'll work going forward, is that we, within these groups, whether it's five consortia, six consortia, 
we submit ideas. They can be direct solicitations from the NCI saying, we want you to study this agent in this tissue, and we compete against the other consortia to get the study. Or it can be what we used to call unsolicited, meaning we put in our own ideas. And it's kind of a combination of both that we do it. And the good or bad of it is, again, to have some centralization, to have some basic themes with it. And uh, the NCI, as our sponsor, just like when you've worked with your own sponsors, they control really all aspects of this, how we do the study, what the budget is, et cetera. And this is just a description of some of the types of studies we've been doing and we hope to do uh, as listed here. And we are getting into more and more vaccine studies and more and more in some other tissue sites. So I've mentioned this before, but to give some of the background, so these are mainly phase one and phase two studies. In cancer prevention studies, or phase one testing really can involve any of these sorts of designs, these populations as listed here. Unlike in cancer therapy, we frequently, not always, but frequently use placebo controls, even in our phase one studies, and I'll give you some examples of why here shortly. Um, and just some examples that are listed there. So to start with, and to give kind of directions, vitamin A derivatives, retinoids, or in this case, rexinoids, have been around for years. They're used in therapy, both systemically and topically, and they are very effective. They are very potent antiproliferatives. And we work with University of Alabama, Birmingham, and have again for years, and they developed a novel rexinoid whether we call it 9C UAB30 or UAB30. And again, just to remind everyone with retinoids and rexinoids, with that superfamily of receptor in ligands, you have ligand binding. In this case, rexinoids preferentially bind to RXR rather than RAR. They bind to RXR and then dimerize, whether it's homodimerization or heterodimerization. And that secondary structure then leads to other tertiary binding and that influences where and what DNA response elements they bind to and where and what promotion gen promoter sites they then activate. And that influences things. And what the researchers at UAB did in our group was some very elegant work showing that with rexinoids that one of the problems is hypertriglyceridemia. And showing some data that that problem is that there's heterodimerization with the liver X receptor rather than with another RXR. And what they engineered was that they made an analog of 9-cis-retinoic acid, which is here, and they substituted in essentially a tetralone ring rather than the, the usual isopentone. And so this tetralone ring led to more specific RXR binding and better homodimerization and less heterodimerization with LXR, and they show that quite elegantly, and did animal studies with it. And we did the first in human studies and then did a phase one study that's been ongoing, unfortunately due to some of the uh, peccadillos of the uh, NCI. This study actually got caught in one of the government shutdowns years ago. And we had to redo the, kind of the protocol because of it, just giving you current news information. We aren't getting stuck in it like we are now, but at the time we did because we were a contract uh, of a specific type. But so this phase one study is looking in healthy volunteers. It's blinded so that we did groups of 10 across the various uh, dose levels. And in each group of 10, eight people would be randomized to active agent and two to placebo because at the end of the study, we were gonna have all these multiple groups of eight that we would then compare. And that's been a value when I show it to you here, the, the actual data. And we did it in such a way that we could look at pharmacokinetics we did day one with a seven-day washout, washout, so we could do full pharmacokinetics. We then did 28 days continuous dosing, and on the last dose, we did another seven-day full washout because, again, retinoids and rexinoids have been known to alter their own metabolism, and we wanted to look for that. So this is just the pharmacokinetics of that. Um, and the main things, the take-homes here, kind of trying to follow lots of data, but is that the pharmacokinetics were linear at least from 0 to 160 milligrams. They weren't linear once we got to 240. Some people think that's because at this point these were 20 milligram tablets that we were getting into far too many capsules and there is data that excess gelatin sometimes can inhibit absorption. 
I don't know that that's the case, but some people wondered about that, and we have reformulated it. And while the AUC changed from day one, day one to day 36, that was more about, in fact, the half-life's a bit longer, and the steady state levels gradually crept up over time, and that led to some of the changes of it, but that there was not evidence of altered metabolism, different clearance from day one to day 36. But the key thing was tolerance. And what we found was that this was incredibly well tolerated. Um, in my line of work, it all, almost is too well tolerated. It worries me a little bit, is it even getting and binding in humans the way we want it to? Because there were none of the usual retinoids or rexinoid side effects. But when we looked at grading of data, what we found was that over time, there were more grade two and grade three events at the higher doses, and it was all about hypertension. Uh, there were more gradable hypertensive events. So we worried, could there be, could this agent be inducing that? Again, we did not see headaches, GI symptoms, any hint of lipids. But in order to make your eyes bleed here a little bit with lots of data here, um, the advantage of a placebo-controlled study is we can look at placebo-controlled and against all the dose groups. And this is actual blood pressure readings over time. So day one is here. And then there's a break. There's just one dose. So it's really the money is, so to speak, day 8 to day 36. And what you find there, placebo's in the very dark and all the other doses, is that when you looked at the actual numbers, there really wasn't any evidence of an increasing blood pressure readout from them. Um, again, we're still looking at that closely with future studies, but I think that was more anomaly of how and how we graded and some changes in how we interpreted gradable blood pressure, which can happen. But then when we look at triglyceride levels, just to make sure, again, here's day one, one dose, and here's day eight through day 36, placebo and the dosing. And again, from comparing from baseline, again, a fair bit of, uh, excuse me, uh, Fluctuation is what we see, but again, no trend and no um, statistical data to support that we we're having an effect on that. So if we summarize this novel rexinoid, that this randomized study gave us, again, good data on pharmacokinetics, on tolerance, and to give you a comparison, 9-cis-retinoic acid, you can maybe give, if you really push it, 20 to 30 milligrams a day, and we're giving people 240 milligrams a day. And in animal testing, the potency, the binding, was equipotent between 9 cis and this UAB30. So we're hopeful that it is a, a better tolerated, equally potent 9 cis retinoic acid uh, analog. So um, we are doing ongoing studies with it right now, breast prevention, skin prevention, and there's some therapy studies going on with it and some interesting possibilities that we're looking at with it. More and more in prevention, just like in therapy in cancer, we are looking to immunology or immunotherapies or we'll make up a word, immunoprevention. And we are fortunate in our group, not only have really great immunology researchers here at the University of Wisconsin, but in our consortia of people who work with us, we've got some great researchers, in this case at the University of Washington, Nora Desis, who's really made a career on building and making vaccines. So she and her colleagues at University of Washington have developed any number of series of DNA-based vaccines. And one of them that we're doing first in human studies as we speak is called, we call it WalkVac. And it's based on, again, a type one uh, epitope-derived vaccine. In this case, based on and on the uh, vector here, which is WACVAC, which is IGF binding protein 2, HER2, and IGF1 receptor. And the reason for those are chosen is, again, when we talk about looking at intraepithelial neoplasia and the genetics and genomics of it, that what we know is that these areas, these genes, are commonly overexpressed in ductal carcinoma in site 2 and LCIS and atypical hyperplasia. So proposing and giving us a potential immunogenic target related to this. So Dr. Deesis and colleagues developed this and have tested it in various models and shown it to be immunogenic and shown it to be effective. 
at regressing or treating carcinoma or carcinoma in situ or hyperplastic lesions in a mouse model. So we are doing a study with that right now that's ongoing and we're on the third dose level. And in this study, it's a single arm study with multiple dose levels, so there's no placebo control. And you'll note that the population is a bit different here, and this is per the FDA. So we're giving it to women who've had breast cancer. So it's not exactly being given to the target population, but that was what the FDA decreed, and so that's how we're doing it. And so people get three dose levels, or three dose levels and three doses, excuse me. And the endpoints of this are that we're looking for immunogenicity, tolerance, and trying to ensure that, in fact, we're having more T helper type 1 cells than type 2 cells because, again, there's strong data that you want to have a preponderance of type 1 interferon gamma producing, IL-2 producing, rather than the helper cells that produce IL-4, IL-10, which tend to inhibit or block that effect. So, again, different endpoints, different things that we look at, and part of the struggle for us is just that. Are we looking at the right thing? So in a vaccine study, we're starting with tolerance and just immunogenicity. And when we move it into the phase two studies, again, it'll be looking at those same things, but trying to look for changes in the tissue directly. So phase two studies that we do within the consortium, again, are tissue specific, even though that phase one study was, the prior one wasn't. And the phase two studies as listed here, again, tissue specific, they are of a slightly longer duration sometimes, but not as long as our phase three studies. And I'm going to show you a couple examples, principally in bladder cancer prevention, that we've done. So this is a study we did early, and it's with genistein, an isoflavone. Um, and I just show it here because in many people, they think of it as a phytoestrogen. Phytoestrogen just meaning it has a structure similar to estradiol. Whether it actually binds to the estrogen receptor or not, that isn't necessarily what a phytoestrogen does. Some do, some don't. But we were interested in it because it has a history and there was in vitro data that it would inhibit EGFR phosphorylation. And so we did a study with that, with that as the primary endpoint. And the schema is over here, and the reason I highlight that is that one of the dilemmas, again, that we face and we try and work around is access to tissue. Again, we don't have a surrogate blood marker. We don't have some other aspect that we know conveys or gives us the information we need. So more often than not, we go directly to the tissue. Well, and the issue is how do we do that in a way where we're not exposing our participants to, to excess risk? And you know, part of why there's been so much study in skin, colon, cervical, other areas is tissue accessibility. And tissues that aren't so accessible haven't had as much research, and we're trying to change that. But in this case with the bladder, we try and build the study around some planned invasive procedure where we're going to get access to tissue. And some people call them window studies, window of opportunity studies, where we'll ask a participant to take our agent or to do our intervention prior to a planned standard procedure, in this case TURBT or surgery. So people randomized to placebo versus two levels of genistein. And this is both an example of positive results, negative results, and kind of what do we do with the results. So the key here, the take home is this basically figures that show EGFR phosphorylation staining. That's the brown stain. So A is benign tissue placebo. B is tumor tissue placebo. C is benign tissue genistein at the low dose. D is tumor genistein at the higher dose. And an interesting phenomenon with a lot of natural products are they seem to preferentially have effects on neoplasia or tumor tissue rather than normal tissue. Now, rightfully so in the audience, you could wonder and say, well, is that really what you want? Aren't you trying to do primary prevention? Aren't you trying to prevent the normal tissue from going? to malignant tissue or, or dysplastic tissue? And the answer is yes. But again, we're still sorting that out relative to what should be our primary endpoints. 
Now, what we can say here is that we gave the agent and it had an effect. Now, the negative is we looked at a lot of other things, including in the tissue, urine, other things, searching for a biomarker, and we came up empty on those. So was this more of a fluke, or was it a sign that we got there and had a biological effect, or is an issue with the fact that, and I'll show you later, we've got so much variability in a lot of our biomarkers that maybe we're kidding ourselves that we're only going to find the result when it's overwhelmingly positive that maybe a modest effect accomplishes what we need, but we've got so much variability we can't detect modest effects in our studies. So another bladder study, again, similar design, is listed here, again, building it around people having a procedure, was looking at green tea, or in this case, polyphenon E, which is a uh, green tea formulation and the different things. And the main kind of aspect of green tea are the catechins. They have the effect, they bind to any number of uh, cellular targets and they are the ones producing the effect in the cells. And again, placebo controlled multiple doses. And what this study showed was, again, we were just trying to make sure that it got to the tissue and that maybe there was some effect. And again, what we showed was that when you look at tissue levels of the green tea catechin, that in fact we did see a somewhat dose effect. The mild negative here is that most people had undetectable levels in the tissue, but some of the people who were getting the low dose or high dose had detectable levels. Nobody in placebo did, whether in normal tissue or tumor tissue. And in fact, in the tissue, we had proliferating cell nuclear antigen, so decreasing proliferation and a dose response. Clustrin, which is an anti-aptototic um, uh, marker, again, going uh, down, which is what we wanted to do, but yet other things we did not have an effect on. And again, where and what this means, well, it certainly means we got to the target tissue. Whether this is enough of an effect to inhibit carcinogenesis is obviously the part we don't know. So where we're going in terms of future directions with our consortium is more and more on vaccines. And we're interested in doing a bit more in gynecologic cancer prevention with our agents, trying to look at topical things. The reason we look at regional delivery or topical delivery is that a lot of our studies, we still find that people poorly tolerate it. Again, tolerance for somebody with advanced cancer is different than somebody that we're just trying to prevent it in. Even the slightest of toxicity sometimes will lead to people not wanting to use it. Or what we've even run into with some of our subspecialists that we go into their clinics, that some of the toxicities that I as an oncologist might be comfortable with, even chronically, some of the other uh, providers aren't comfortable with. So that leads to, again, us looking at different aspects of it. And we'll touch a little bit on most of these in terms of future directions. So the vaccines I've mentioned a little bit already, DNA-based vaccines, the WACVAC. We are looking at, again, from Washington, looking at a stem cell-based or stem vac vaccine, which we think has, in preclinical data, support its potential to prevent or limit the development of estrogen and progesterone receptor-negative breast cancers. Again, we're very good at, at least we think, of preventing hormone receptor positive breast cancer, whether it's tamoxifen, or raloxifene, or the aromatase inhibitors. But what we do not change, what we've never been able to show an effect on, is triple negative or ERPR negative breast cancer development. And our hope is that this more stem cell based protein might be a av avenue there. There's ongoing data that we have and that others have developed within our consortium that combining retinoids and rexinoids with vaccines propagates and synergizes with each effect. So we're very interested in looking at that, Doug McNeil's work in prostate cancer vaccines. And as I mentioned earlier, we are waiting to do a novel HPV vaccine that's L2 particle based. Just to remind you, L1, late one protein, capsid protein, is what the current vaccines are based on because it's the most immunogenetic aspect. The negative is there's, they're very genotype specific, whereas L2, the DNA sequence is conserved across all genotypes. So the preliminary data with this L2 vaccine that's developed 
by Richard Roden out of Hopkins and a researcher out of the University of Vienna that will work with us, is that the L2-based vaccine, it literally is immunogenetic across all genotypes. So we are hopeful about the possibilities with that. We are also getting into, again, ovarian gynecologic cancer prevention. And an interesting phenomenon here is the data that's come out that many different ovarian cancers don't originate on the ovarian epithelium. They actually originate in the fallopian tube epithelium. And there, in fact, is, with, as with almost all cancers, a preneoplastic derivative. In this case, serous tubal intraepithelial neoplasia, or carcinoma. And we can find this in women, and we have models that support it. And as the data shows here, that is, is again, a potential target for us to look at. So whether it's our researchers here, Dr. Patenkar, Lisa Barrelet, or researchers at the University of Oklahoma that have just joined our consortium, we're looking at novel agents that we want to develop with this in mind. And again, how would we do those studies? Well, probably building them as window of opportunity studies, looking at women who are scheduled for uh, fallopian tube removal, whether for benign reasons, whether potentially for even cancerous reasons, and asking them to get involved in the studies. And just to kind of a take home with this, as you would imagine, it's not an easy sell. Uh, we've done both survey research on this and uh, actually doing the research, and what we tend to find is of eligible participants, we get, if we're doing a really good job, we get about 10 to 20 percent of the eligible people to agree. And that is probably uh, accurate and apropos because, again, they aren't getting a whole lot of benefit to no benefit. So, again, we have to really work that, and, and uh, people altruistically are frankly doing it. Topical approaches we're looking at a bit more and more because, again, as I mentioned earlier, we're struggling a bit with the toxicity and the tolerance of our systemic agents. So cervical carcinoma in situ, or cervical intraepithelial aplasia, we are doing studies, many of them originating here with Paul Lambert and Hassan Mukhtar, and we're about to do a study in Korea. We're looking at topical green tea for sin. We've got new collaborators out of Staten Island University. Betty Steinberg is actually a well-known researcher in pap uh, pulmonary HPV papillomatosis, but is very interested in looking at HPV effects in the cervix, and they've developed a topical formulation of all natural products here, curcumin, green tea, resveratrol, that shows really profound effects in the models and some of the organotypic models, both that what we've done and others have done. So we are interested in exploring that a bit further. But as I mentioned earlier, one of the issues we struggle with is biomarker variability. And this is an ongoing research project with Wei Wang from Pathology here. And what this depicts is this issue, and it's th other things we need to think about controlling for. And this is looking at, in this case in prostate cancer, in looking within biopsies or prostatectomy samples, looking at proximity, looking at variability and in proliferation indices, in this case KI67 from the tumor, the invasive disease, to very adjacent, normal appearing, but which likely is not genotypically normal, to slightly more distant, to very distant. So the disease is four, excuse me, um, the tumor is four right here, then you've got adjacent, which is one, two, three, and again what we see, and we see this in other tissues too, when you look in proximity you see similar biomarker changes than when you look more distantly. And a lot of times when we're getting tissue, we're not sure, relatively speaking, where it's coming from. Is it, if we're looking at normal epithelium, is it right next? Is it distant? Those are things we have to control for. And we're also looking at in this study across 20 to 30 samples, just better categorizing the variability. Because to be honest, even though we've been doing these studies, no one's really done that yet. And I'm a little concerned that, again, our designs aren't taking that into consideration, just the inherent variability that we run into. And different future directions are listed here uh, with collaborators at Hopkins. Dr. Stearns has developed, again, looking at epigenetics, in this case methylation, specific genetic changes, 
and doing it with random perioreolar fine needle aspiration. There's a lot of breast cancer prevention studies that are based on cytology of doing multiple fine needle aspirations from the breast, getting epithelial cells, and then looking at them, whether it's proliferation indices or, in this case, trying to quantify methylation. And they've done some nice work that showed that it was as potentially as good as looking at atypia, nuclear atypia, which is at least viewed somewhat as a standard indices of cytologies in breast neoplasia. But again, trying to follow the lead of all of you, what, how you look at, whether it's blood pressure readings or lipid levels, trying our best to come up with quantifiable, quantitative biomarkers for neoplasia, whether progression or regression of that neoplasia. Or looking at metabolic status. It's something that um, many of us have been interested in, whether it's Roz, myself, others, of how we might incorporate metabolism more into this. So collaborators at Penn State, uh, Dr. Andrea Mani, are, have done work looking at omega-3 fatty acids and different work as listed here. And in some studies they've done that correlated, and again, whether this is subsetting and it's a quirk of biostatistics or whether it's a true unique effect, but what they found with a somewhat related uh, formulation of uh, omega-3 fatty acid with raloxifene is that only women of a BMI over 29 showed a decreased breast density when taking this compared to placebo. So again, whether we should stratify better, how we look at the different functions and aspects of carcinogenesis, or even, as I mentioned in the beginning, germline aspects. Again, another collaborator at, at Hopkins has done work looking at SOD2, as listed here, uh, manganese SOD dismutase which is involved in, again, metabolism. And there's a lot of work in theory that views that the environment around us, and especially nutrients, may have very profound effects in some and no effects in others, and it might have to do with germline metabolism changes. And that's what they looked at and found some data to potentially support that and are pursuing other studies quantifying and stratifying people related to germline metabolism changes. So in closing, in terms of cancer prevention, agent development, or chemo prevention in general, again, we're still, to be honest, struggling with where and how we look at this and how we can do it in a more biologically driven or systematically driven way. But my feeling is that we're not waiting for Godot, that it isn't a useless or absurd me waiting around for something that isn't going to happen that I do think this is going to happen because basically our ability to risk identify, to stratify is getting better. And when we develop and hopefully get better um, surrogate markers, then I think industry will be more interested in us. Right now they're not because we've been very good at killing their drugs rather than advancing them. Um, so when that happens, I think it will happen. And that and the fact that, and I'm not even saying it should be this way, but all of you know as practitioners that what's evolved is that 50 years ago, the vast majority of our society feud, feared at great detail heart disease, that I'll just get struck down. And what we learned and what the research that was done is that there are predictabilities of it, and there are ways to intervene and to lessen your risk. And probably what's happened is that people don't realize there also can be inheritable risks related to vascular disease, et cetera. But in cancer, what we know is that people are very fatalistic, and they tend to view they're either getting it or they're not. And that fear drives people. So I have no doubt that in many ways, unfortunately, there will be a big market for cancer prevention when we get better at it. Because again, when I started, a lot of the preventative things we do now weren't there. But as people got better and we did it better, that led to that. So I think it is an area that will continue to grow and advance. And for the next generation of providers, in good or bad ways, I think you'll be dealing with your people trying to sort through what preventative agents they should go on or not go on. So just the University of Wisconsin acknowledgments is listed here. Again, a lot, lot of people involved in this um, that are critical to just a little bit of the research that I showed here, and there's much more going on related to that. 
So with that, I thank you for your time and the opportunity to present this, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Dr. Leo. So the question pertaining to lung cancer prevention agent development and what are the issues with it, well, again, that's an example of where because the tissue wasn't very accessible, uh, on a regular basis because we don't do, and I'm not saying we should do this, screening, bronchoscopies, et cetera. Um, that's been a little bit slower or behind others, but there is, again, data that you find bronchial dysplasia, other aspects of it. People have looked at uh, uh, whether it's uh, from coughing, sputum analysis, breath condensates to try and gather epithelial cells to look at that, looked at imaging aspects of it. So there are ongoing preventative agents that are being studied for lung cancer prevention, trying to find it, whether it's in bronchial dysplasia. Where some studies have been done have been looking at, with the new advent appropriately of CT screening for people at lung cancer risk, is what to do with people with small indeterminate pulmonary nodules. Now again, I'm not even sure it is the right thing to do, but because we're a little hard up trying to find surrogates. So there have been a bunch of studies that have looked at men and women that have been found to have small pulmonary nodules and they've randomized them to intervention studies looking to see which pulmonary nodules might diminish or go away and which ones don't. And again, the cat's being, we don't even know if those pulmonary nodules are the right target because they oftentimes are benign. But so lung cancer prevention is an example of we struggle there because again, we don't have access to tissue as well, that we don't have surrogate markers and the imaging and 10 years ago, we had a lot of big plans related to imaging for lung cancer prevention, and we still have hopes for that, whether it's functional imaging, those sorts of things, but that's been kind of the drawback there. Um, in lung cancer prevention, we are looking at uh, tobacco, you know, trying to inhibit tobacco carcinogenesis, maybe that's the target, looking at trying to change some of the uh, tobacco DNA adduct effects and giving agents for that. So because of the volume of people at risk for lung cancer, it should be a priority and we are trying to do that. But that's an example where kind of technology and our knowledge hasn't advanced enough that we even know what we're doing, to be blunt, at times related to it. We did some uh, even pilots here at the UW about 15 years ago trying to look at breath condensates. Again, stealing from the allergy immunology group who were looking at that related to asthma and we wanted to capture and see what we could look at from the bronchial epithelial cells. So people are, you know, we're trying, but we've got a ways to go with that. Other questions? Yes. So it's a, so the question being, rather than maybe um, intervening with a new agent or new systemic exposure, why not just prevent the systemic exposure that leads to the carcinogenesis? So that is certainly the work, a great deal of work in epidemiology and population con cancer control. Um, uh, on some level, obviously, tobacco is a good example of that. The ongoing work with alcohol is a good example of that. There's researchers that and population researchers that I work with, in case you didn't remember, I'm from North Dakota, so I'll just remind that again. Um, in North Dakota, uh, where I grew up, you know, it's cold, we have uh, basements, and as many of you know, radon exposure in the Midwest is quite high. And there's data to imply that whether here in Wisconsin or especially in North Dakota when I was growing up huddled in my basement when it was 30 blanking degrees below zero outside, 
that uh, I was getting exposed, because we didn't know any better, to radiation on a regular basis. And in North Dakota, they have the highest incidence of chronic lymphocytic leukemia of any place in the country, and the theory is it's radon and, and basements. And back in the day, we didn't have radon um, kits and et cetera. But, so that's a good question, and people are doing that and trying to do that. But it's even, you could say, the greatest way and best way for society to prevent cancers is probably behavioral changes or population or pollution changes. And that's absolutely true. But clearly, we still got a ways to go related to that. And this isn't to get into the politics of any of that. But So there's that. So I don't deny that at all, that the greatest way forward to limit cancer is to do the behavioral things that we know matter. Uh, but even when we get more successful at that, there are always going to be groups of us that have inherited or developed increased risk so that those population or behavioral measures won't affect that. And that's true whether that's in heart disease or vascular disease or kidney disease, or in this case in cancer. So obviously I'm biased because it's what I study and what I do, but I certainly strongly view that there's still a importance and a value to trying to find these agents and, and develop them. Any other questions? I think, well, any other questions come to the front because we're a little bit after nine. Thanks. Thank you.